What's up guys and gals and welcome to the Great Whale Road. So I wasn't so sure about this game so I figured I'd let you guys figure it out for yourself whether or not you liked it. We're gonna do two or three episodes of this game. It's kind of a weird, it's kind of an odd title in all honesty. It's like they took the Banner Saga and then kind of dialed the narrative back a little bit and then added like a civilization manager to it. It's a weird game where essentially you play as a group of Vikings who are recovering from being raided and you have to take your little township from being like whack and lame and all kinds of faded and then turn it into the most baller colony ever where you got like Vikingy bling chains or whatever. I don't know how Vikings show off that they're, they're balling all day every day. So anyways, there's combat, it's turn-based, it's very simple. And then aside from that, you kind of just enjoy traveling around in your long boats and providing for your city. I was a little on the fence about it because some aspects of the game are not quite as polished as I would like, but then on the opposite hand, it's still a cool concept for a game, and so it's still being developed. Hopefully that'll all get patched over, but let's play a new campaign. We can choose right now. We have the Danes, and then the rest of them are apparently coming soon. I assume that it's going to be the Danes, the Saxons, or the Dane Saxons, and the Saxons, or something like that. There might even be Normans involved, although I'm not really sure. So the Danes settling in Iverstead are hardy folks, and they have to be. Their hamlet is close to the Saxon borderlands, and they aren't from a major trading, aren't far from a major trading route, which connects Doristad in the south with Rib in the north. All this makes it a prime target for opportunistic or cross-border raids. All right, so I guess we'll play as the Dannys for right now. In the words of Saul Goodman, everybody needs a Danny. The leaves have started to change their color, but the ship has not returned. The Jarl had left early in the season with his Swiss Carls and most of his experienced warriors. A message from his brother had asked him to travel south to the land of the Saxons with haste. Some of the locals had rebelled against the perceived Danish occupation despite the brother's marriage to a Saxon chieftain's daughter. The Jarl had long traded with the Saxon tribes in the area and had bought slaves and sold them ivory combs as well as other trinkets from the north. He was well respected and had guest rights in many a hall, which was the reason why his brother had asked him to come in person. You did not receive news for a long time until the same messenger returned. The treacherous Saxons ambushed your warriors. The whole village is in mourning. The elders and Kettle decide who will have to become the new leader. The village is not defenseless, but its defenses have been seriously weakened. The new leader will have to train a new warband and be prepared for winter raids, especially once the news of your loss spreads to the nearby clans. Everyone who can hold a spear or shoot a bow is welcome to join, because weapon skill is easier acquired than bravery. So we can go with Floki. Floki deserves a chance. He spends more time playing the Lear than on the practice field, but he is the nephew of the Jarl and deserves a chance at leadership. Or we can go with Bera. Bera is a good choice. She is tough and she is wise. She has led her family for many winters and knows how to use an axe. You know, I'm not a big fan of letting the musician lead the colony. Apparently we live in warlike times. I'm going to let the warrior lead the colony. Warlike times, I'll tell you what, if there's ever a musical time, he can be the leader. But right now this is war time. This is Viking time. So I need somebody that knows how to cleave scalps. Not everyone is happy that you hold a sword, but it is your right to swear an oath in Freya's name. Most of the folk swear to Odin, but you also th see Thor's amulets being touched. Some of the other women carry long knives and give their oaths to Freya like you do. Freya is not only beautiful, but a warrior after all. So essentially the way that this works, I'm probably not going to use a whole lot of these little menu things right here. I'll explain what we're doing as we play the game and as we go along. It all doesn't really seem to affect much. I played for like two hours last night to get a feel for the lay of the land and kind of get my sea legs as a Viking. And honestly, things seem to go pretty well regardless of what you choose. Like, you don't starve to death or anything like that. I think the point of the game is more the narrative than anything else. But still, there is management here and we'll talk about that in just a second. You have to plan for winter because you can't do anything but hunt in the winter. I do think they could bring the font size up by... Oh, I don't know. These fonts right here are probably running like 10 point, maybe even smaller. They should bring up the font sizes to, or at least capitalize everything or something. I'd Maybe not. Capitalizing would look ugly. But if they could bring the font sizes up, that'd be great too, because on a larger screen, it gets very, very difficult to read some of the text sometimes, especially if you've got bad eyes like I do. Just a little thing that I noticed straight away when I was playing the other evening. 
Uh, so what we can do is we have focus points. We get 10 of these per year. So once per year, we have a meeting of the clan where we take our focus points and we assign them to various aspects of Viking life. So farming, husbandry, hunting, warfare, diplomacy, traditions, and craftsmanship. This builds stuff. This keeps morale high. This makes sure people don't attack us. This makes sure people don't attack us. This makes sure we can get food in the winter. Same for husbandry. And then farming gives you a ton of food, but you only get it in the spring and summer. So husbandry and hunting give you less food, but you can get them year round, whereas farming gives you a huge docket of food. And you can see the expected results for the year over here. So let's see how this changes when we add a couple of fuck use points in here. So we add, let's say, three points in husbandry. That means that next year we will get an additional shepherd and our food stocks will go up considerably. I think that that's worthwhile. I'm also going to consider doing the same thing with hunters. So that's going to take us up a little bit and next season we will have seven hunters. We might even have six shepherds if we take them up next season. Yeah, it looks like we might have six shepherds if we do that. In addition, my suggestion would be if we have enough, I would like to have... Well, we already have 17 warriors. I mean... In total, it looks like we've got about 35, 40 people in our colony. And if 17 of them are warriors, that means that a large portion of our force here is people already ready to fight. And so I don't think our defense is quite so bad as we might have originally thought. Instead, let's add a little bit to farming. And I don't think we can do much with traditions. Can't do much with craftsmen. Can't do much with warfare. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take craftsmanship. Actually, let's go ahead and dump it all into farming for right now. I didn't really want to do that, but that's what we're going to do. So now what happens is it's going to fast forward like 40 days at a time, and there's going to be events you have to resolve now that winter has arrived. The weather at land might still be pleasant enough, but the whale road turns into an angry and fickle beast once the leaves change color. And so basically the way this game works is at the beginning of the year, you make a plan. Winter gets here. You survive through the winter. Then you have spring and summer, which I think are the raiding season, and that's when we get to sail out in our boat, and then we come back, we have another meeting, and it rinses and it repeats until your society is dead. That's basically, in a nutshell, the feeling that I got from the game. The hens of your biggest flock have stopped laying eggs. One of the elders confirms your suspicion. All of the chickens have worms. Um... Oh, I don't know. What cures chickens? I've never kept hens before. I'm not really sure what helps chickens with worms. Or if it even can be helped at our current tech level. Garlic cloves, maybe? Do worms not like garlic? I don't know. The chickens don't seem worse off, and there are more worms in their shit. So, apparently that helped. We got plus 50 food for that event, which was great. See how it's now day 38 up here? It tracks the season, it tracks the day, and so spring has finally arrived. That means that it's time for us to go out and raid. Now, this can change. Like, you can get, like, ten events in between the start of winter and the end, or you can get, like, one event like we just got. You never really can tell how bad the winter is going to be until it gets here. And so we skipped, essentially, an entire season right there. I think we start out kind of in December-ish anyways. Not really sure, but now that we're at spring, this is what our production looks like. So our population is currently at 36. I was right, 35 or so. I just eyeballed the numbers. Either way, we've got six hunters, four shepherds, three farmers, 17 warriors, one bard, one priest, and a crafts four craftsmen. Uh, we saved 1,700 barrels of food from last year. We have 2,100 winter production. We consumed 1,300, which means that left for summer, we have 25, 24. So I think what happens right there is it takes these two numbers, it adds them, and then subtracts what we ate during winter, and we end up with 2,500 barrels of food. Our summer production is expected to be 657, so that's good. Our leader is Barra the Grumpy, with two Ps, the Grumpa P, the Grumpy P. And then we got 50 food stocks from the worms that were coming out of the butts of our chickens. Disgusting, but that's Viking life. You do what you got to do. So now the game is going to get a little bit more expanded. Now we have access. Now that it's spring, we have access to the different areas. So we can look at our settlement storage and see what we have here. We have 16 pelts. Uh, largely, you would want to trade these away as far as I understand. I tend to collect a lot of them. Then I trade them for other things that I want, like war dogs and stuff like that, that I can deploy in combat. Uh, we've got the blacksmith. At the blacksmith, you have the opportunity to spend some of your silver 
up here at the top. So we've got tools, we've got silver, we've got food, and we've got population. You can spend your silver on new weapons if you desire. Uh, there's oaken clubs. The stats right here are essentially that's how many attacks you get on your turn. That's the bonus to your accuracy. That's how far away the enemy can be before you can strike them. That means adjacency. And then it's chance of breaking an opponent's leg or breaking their shield when you fight them. It's also got the weight and other assorted things in here. It's really kind of up to you to decide what you want to get up in here. There are weapons that are really, really good, and there are weapons that are not so good. We've got a couple people that are using light hunting spears. We could afford to upgrade, and so let's go ahead and I'm going to buy a war spear so that we can equip that on one of our warband. And our warband can be found through right here. So heroes are essentially the people that go questing in spring. You get these heroes, you accumulate them through events, they have personalities, they talk while you're on your sea voyages and stuff like that, and they're not bad. I mean, it's kind of cool the way that the whole thing functions. So he's got a light hunting spear. I think we can change this around. He's a heavy. His personality, you can see right here, I don't know how much this affects things, but he is brave, he has fidelity, he is compassionate, he's a law follower, he has a sense of duty, uh, he's not very humble, he doesn't hold much belief in the gods, and he's not entirely truthful. He is a, lo he's a liar, essentially. And so essentially these bits of his personality are how hard he adheres to each of these ideas. And you can see they vary around with different people. This guy also enjoys knife licking, in case you were wondering. This was the other guy that we could potentially turn into our war chief, but I don't know. I think... So with our battle stats here, we can change him over to the Ash War Spear. Which I think is a really good idea, because the Ash Warp Spear is essentially superior to the Light Spear in, like, every way. So he's got the War Spear, you've got the Light Hunting Spear. If I give you the Ash War Spear, yeah, it gives us a better chance of torn meniscus. And it gives him four attacks in a turn, which is actually a big deal. The characters that tend to have multiple attacks, because characters only have, like, five HP, when you attack, it's a hit or it's a miss or it's a block. If it's a block, the defender loses a piece of armor. So, for example, he's got four defense right there. That means he's got four pieces of armor. If he gets hit and blocks, he loses one of that defense. And when he's all out of defense, the blocks become hits too, and he starts losing HP. You lose one HP for any hit. It doesn't matter. So that's why attacking four and five times in one go is a really, really good thing. Because it gives you a chance to A, shear off their armor before you know they deal damage to you. And then B, it gives you the chance to break through and start dealing real damage and start stacking you know, penalties and red text on top of them as well. So for right now, our journal. We've got a quest. Our first journey. The more experienced warriors will share their knowledge with you on this journey, and you have to learn a lot. The new, boar, the new war band is with you. Embark on your first sea journey and travel to Dankirk. So let's go ahead and set our journey. Now that our journey has been set, this will pop up, which is essentially who's going on the mission. We need to add people to the war band. I'm going to bring Baugi and I'm gonna bring Hild. He attacks five times, his accuracy is 75, he's got a short Sayax, and he's got Odin's Blessing as his armor. Protection against stun, broken ribs, each equipped character becomes a support unit. I don't know what dodge, I think that's dodge actually. DOD goes up. There's nothing that looks like it matches up with that. He also, every character has things that they add to your group. And so, you have cards that you can play on your characters. Every person brings their own cards and adds them to your deck. And so, at times, I might actually bring him instead. So they got four, four, what does he have? Five and two. So he's a bit more attacky, but he takes damage a bit more. We can only bring four people, so it's like, really, what are you going to do at the end of the day? We do have a lot of heavies. Instead of Hild, let's bring Floki. I never bring Floki, I always leave him out. What does he count as? He's a support class character, so that means most of his cards are gonna make other people better. We'll give it a go. We shouldn't be fighting on this journey. I, If we fight on this journey, it means something has gone very, very wrong. Now we gotta choose what we wanna load up our boat with before we go. Pay attention to your weight, you can only carry 90 capacity. So I would say that bringing 15 food should be suitable. I don't think we'll need more than 15 food. And then I would bring maybe five tools to trade 
from there we've got furs. I would say to bring maybe, how much do we have left? 35. Bring 15 furs with us. And for the five, what remain, let's bring two more food and one more tool. And we're going to trade this stuff off. Or we'll use the tools to fix the boat if anything goes wrong during our voyage. We also have mead and we have honey, but honey was like gold back in these days. You don't give that away for money. You trade that for alliances and things of that nature. Mead is also a big deal because you need the honey to make the mead. And if you've never had mead, I highly recommend it. Mead is delicious, especially if you mill it first. Mead is not drunk. I mean, traditionally, you can drink it straight out of the bottle if you want, but traditionally, you boil the mead a little bit. You heat it, and you get it to the point where it's steaming, and then you add spices to it. And that way, the alcohol burns off a little bit, but at the same time, it's still alcoholic. And then it's got the spices. It's a very, very delicious drink. Very festive. If you've never tried it before, I do recommend it. Ship capacity is chilling at 70 right now. Are you sure? Oh, did I miscalculate? I must have miscalculated. Bring more food. Whatever. That's cool. Whatever food we don't use, we can sell. So who cares? And then once that's all set up, we got to go to Dankirk and we start our journey. Your new crew must learn the ropes and will get the chance to buy some equipment with whatever meager funds you have available. Most of the good mail was lost with your father's war band, and apart from Kettle's Burnie, all is rusty and in poor shape. Luckily, there are plenty of spears and shields left, if few war axes and even fewer swords. Alright, so when we go on a quest... Essentially, every character has three stats. They have, like, their health, they have their energy, and they have... I don't know what the fiery thing is. The fiery thing... Well, one of our characters started out with no fiery thing, so I don't know what that does. But they'll lose energy as we row around. And they most of you ate oysters bought off of fishermen. It seems they were off. You get events that you gotta resolve while you're sailing. I told you those oysters smelled dodgy. Well, we got 30 seconds to decide. We can sacrifice some mead... You let them drink plenty of light ale until everyone is recovered, or we can let them feed the fish. Um, we don't have mead, so drink plenty of light ale, I guess. The crew recovers their strength. Good. Glad to hear it. Glad to hear it. So we went through some food right there. We ate three of our food. And then we're already at Dankirk. If you wanted to see where we're at right now, you can take a look at the map screen. We started out from Ulfarstead, and then we went to Dankirk. Later on, we'll be sailing, like, all over the place, down to Frisia and everything else. It's going to get wild, believe me. We go to Spain. We go all over the place. We go up to Britain. I mean, you can sail everywhere if you want. It was a short trip to Dankirk, the seat of an underking and a beach market. It is a small marketplace, but well-maintained. The beach can be accessed freely, but any attacker would be a practice target for every warrior with a throwing spear or bow behind a ramp and palisade. The hall itself is on a low hill behind a separate wall. Access to the hall is limited to the household and invited guests. Burly guards and chainmail ensure the peace. Alright, so inside settlements we can do a number of things. Uh, you can tell people to go to the tavern. When they go to the tavern, they feast, and so they drink and they listen to stories and rumors. And so there's a chance when you send people to the tavern for the night, they will come back with rumors about quests and stuff like that that you can do. And at the bare minimum, they get some of their strength back from feasting all night, although that usually leaves me feeling kind of tired. We can go to the trader, which is definitely a place that we want to be. I'm going to trade off as many of these furs as I can. And so that should give us 400 silver now to play around with, which I feel is important because we need to buy new weaponry and new armor to make sure that our warband does not sucketh the ass off the world. And so let us go ahead and trade that. That's another 25 bucks. We've got 450 silver coins now. We traded away some of our little things. They've got wine available. They've got horn combs available. They've got slaves available. I think you can just take these like trade objects like EVE Online style and just sell them wherever you want to sell them at. My suggestion would now be that we take our gains and we go over here. There are swords and all kinds of stuff that we can do. That would give her a double attack and she would lose her accuracy bonus. We have nobody that uses a throwing spear. Ash War Spear is already ready to go. 
That would give her three attacks instead of the one. She would lose a little bit of accuracy, but since she's a hero, I don't think it's going to matter anyways. I'm going to go ahead and... What's her accuracy to begin with? Zero. A sword is... I mean, I expect of my leader to carry a sword, you know what I mean? Let's go with the mace. It's cheap, and it's available. And so I think we can go through here now. And assuming we give her the iron mace, she loses 5% accuracy, but she gets 6 attacks. That's not so bad. I mean, 2 extra attacks at a 7, I think that should balance out statistically. Six attacks at 75 versus four attacks at 80. I'm pretty sure the six attacks are going to win out if the two go up against each other. I mean, there should be some variance there, but 5% shouldn't be statistically relevant enough. We can also assign people to go hunting. If they go hunting, they will bring back furs, and they will bring back food while they're out and about, and you may get hunting events. We can also sleep in the hall if you wanted to specifically just work on making people get their energy levels back. They shouldn't need to get their energy levels back. Energy is looking pretty solid right now. You got HP, you've got energy, and I forget what the fire thing is. I think it's like morale or something like that. I don't know. I forget what the the bottom one is. When this runs out, you can't take any more actions in your boat, and you have to like rest and stop somewhere. And the HP runs out. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Bad things happen. Uh, let's camp out here for the night. At I'm going to send a couple of people to the feasting hall. And I'm going to send two out to hunt. And as you can see, you can see the effects of what you're doing. They're losing energy for going and hunting, and she's getting energy back, or morale back, from feasting. We may want to actually, since he's already at full, we may want to send him out on the hunt instead. And then... Let me pull you from here. I'm going to have you feast for a little bit. There you go. So in our journal, nothing has really happened just yet. We're still waiting to see what happens. Once you lock everything in, you hit stay overnight. For many of you, this is the first time you've left the island in your life. Dan Kirk and its traders are an exotic sight. Kettle is amused when you ogle a trader from far away Byzantium. He has the darkest skin that you've ever seen until one of his guards appears out of a tent. A giant, even if he were a half-troll gat, and black as sea coal. You are mesmerized by the quality of the silks, weapons, and other luxury items on show. But most is far beyond the handful of hack silver in your purse. Kettle introduces you to a trader, Hildebald, from a place called Spania. He knew your Jarl and owed him a small debt. He offers you a pick from his wares as a settlement. So... We can take some wine, we can take some fine cotton, or we can take some silver. I'm gonna take the cotton. You will find a craftsman to cut the cloth and turn the cotton into breeches. Hooray, we have pantalones. And so that was our first journey. And it's essentially the game just getting us situated and letting you know what you can and cannot do with each of the seasons. After your return from Dankirk, you spend the rest of the summer being chased over the training field by Kettle, and you are losing count of how many times you've had to form a shield wall and how many bruises you've received. The season goes by quickly, and the leaders of nearby clans know that Uflerstead has teeth again. After the summer has ended, so our journeys on the sea here, 12 population, 29 food stocks. We came back with over 400 silver, so that's really, really good. It was a good mercantile. The Scald sings songs about your deeds, and everybody in the longhouse will drink to your health. Hooray! Nobody's cursing me yet. That comes later, once I inevitably screw all this up. It's his mood. That bottom one is their mood, so that's how apparently moody they're feeling. And that's the flow of the game. Now it's the second year, so as I told you previously, we'll have another clan meeting. Once we have the clan meeting, or the clan... Is that what it's called? I don't know. Either way, once we have a meeting 
for Ooferstead. It's got oof in it. Everybody loves something with oof in it. The meeting of the clan. Yes, we'll have to decide what we want to dedicate our stuff to this time around. And so anyways, I will see you on the next episode. This game is called The Great Whale Road. If you wanted to check it out, it's not out yet. You can get it next week. But I'll have the link for you all the same just in case you happen to watch this video next week or after. Because I feel like that might be a probable thing that will happen. I will see you all in future episodes. Hi-do, everybody.